Hey everyone, as mentioned, uh, my name is Bill. I come from a company called Databricks and, and we'll sort of get into some of my own biases having worked there and stuff like that. But first, let's start off with some uh, quick overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, start off with some introductions, naturally set some context. I'll quote somebody smarter than myself. That's always a good strong start. We'll talk about some of the historical context for sort of my work coming from MIMS, et cetera. And then we'll dive into the patterns for successful projects that I've seen from customers. And then lastly, we'll finish it with, uh, with another quote by another smart person. So um, one quick plug here, I guess quasi-promotion. Um, we've got a great conference coming up in June. You all should attend. It's really, really fun. I've gone the last like two or three years, um, both for being a part of Databricks and not. And it's really, really great. I get a ton of value out of it. Um, yeah, you can, get, uh, you can get a discount and everything like that. So now that we're moving on to introductions, just by show of hands, how many students are in the audience? OK, fair enough. Um, and then how many folks in industry? OK, not fair. And then um, how many people have heard of Apache Spark? OK, good. Um, so really quickly about, about Databricks, right? We saw sort of that Venn diagram of, of the different uh, sort of skill sets. And Databricks is really trying to help companies or, or individuals really unify those different processes, people, and, and information. And you know, we're a sort of late stage startup, have a ton of customers. Uh, if you guys are doing any Apache Spark related work, it, uh, it would behoove you to come check it out, uh, at least for your own knowledge. Um, and then, quick introduction of myself. Um, I'm a product manager at Databricks. I've been at Databricks for almost two and a half years. Um, did recently finish this book. It was a lot of work. It's like 600 pages or something. And uh, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to write it with the guy that created Spark. And really what we've tried to do is make it very, very simple, right? The, sort of subtitle of the book is Big Data Processing Made Simple. That's really why Spark is so popular. And we really wanted something that's approachable for, for any sort of level. And so even, you know, first 50 pages are, are something that really anybody should be able to come and pick up something from it. So, you know, in the MIMS program, there's always a, a really big, and in the MIDS program, uh, there's a big focus on bias. And so I'd rather just come out and say, uh, at least propose some of my own biases. And uh, firstly, in undergrad, I studied history. So I really like to look at the context in which thing appears, things appear. I like to look at the past, try and find some lessons, and then sort of apply them or see if they apply to, to sort of current day. And that's going to be a theme of this particular talk. Um, yeah, I did my, my two years at MIMS. It was really, really awesome. Some of you may have seen me as well in the Python bridge course. That was another lucky thing that I, that I had the opportunity to, to participate in. And uh, yeah, that, that's just sort of uh, a little bit about me from the historical perspective. So now here's my quote by a smart person. Um, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And you probably know it from the do not study variation, but really the, the same lessons kind of apply. And I think this context is going to be really important for this talk because I'm really going to focus at, at trying to draw some parallels between uh, you know, some of the historical context of, of big data and how we can sort of learn something in the data science world as well. So here's going to be a very incomplete and biased history of big data. So um, some folks over at Google um, about 2003 and 2004 uh, published some papers about, uh, you know, GFS is the Google file system, as well as MapReduce, sort of the compute engine uh, associated with that. And really, this kind of kicked off kind of the big data movement, right? Because it enabled you to store lots of information and then operate on top of it. And naturally, in a couple of years after that, right, Google has their really cool tools. Um, you know, the open source world sort of uh, jumps on the ba bandwagon, and you can see sort of like some of the commits are, are from 2013. Um, and Doug Cunning, he's founder of Cloudera, still chief architect there. Um, you know, this is sort of getting Hadoop started, right? Something you all have probably 
heard of and, and interacted with. And what I think is, is really nice when you can sort of compare these things is like, hey, they, they have sort of defined roles, right? They have specific objectives. And I think now that we've reached sort of Hadoop in, in 2018, what we've seen here is just this, uh, you know, something like 30 tools, I think I count. Yeah, 31. Um, 31 tools that are all just sort of in this big data ecosystem. And, and it ends up being, uh, you know, just sort of things fall apart at the seams, right? We have to tie all of these different particular things together and tie together all of these sort of uh, uh, really extreme skill sets, right? And, and, you know, just recently writing this book on Spark, right? Just like one little piece of the puzzle here. Um, there's still so much that I don't know. And I don't know how anyone is supposed to have any really strong understanding of, of any number of these tools. And, and really when I had looked at these, uh, at looked at this sort of tool set, one word really jumped out at me and that is complex. And I don't even really mean that as a negative or a positive. It's literally by definition consisting of many different and connected parts, right? And so this complexity sort of ends up bringing projects down, right? And I'll, I'll sort of echo that as, as a fundamental pattern. And I think one of the reasons why Spark has really been so successful is that Spark's philosophy is really about providing a unified engine that allows you to do a lot of different things and then high level abstractions to make it so you can very easily understand it, right? And so Spark being this engine can work with your data wherever it lives. And then you can take on streaming, SQL, machine learning, graph analysis, et cetera. And so really, I think when you look at this history, what we're going to see is that the history of big data is really just this history of complexity, right? Complexity in tools, complexity in use cases, et cetera. And I think a fair analogy here is looking at the evolution of consumer electronics, right? So here we have the Google file system and MapReduce. And then we end up with like the Hadoop ecosystem where you have all of these sort of single purpose tools where it's like, hey, I need to make a phone call, but then I want to play games um, or I want to entertain my kids. Um, and then I want to listen to music, et cetera. And then ending up with this really unified sort of device, right? And I think the key hypothesis I, I would have would, is that the history of data science will very much echo at least some of this history of big data. I think, you know, now we'll sort of draw maybe a little bit more of a, a, of a defined comparison to, to sort of kind of see how it stack, stacks up a little bit. So when we look at the timeline, and um, I guess I probably, yeah, it's, it's tough following up such amazing uh, visualizations. Admittedly, mine are not as good. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, yeah. So, as I was saying, as I was saying, um, you know, over the past, you know, decade and a half or so, we've seen this sort of consistent uh, development where, hey, a couple of sort of things to kick it off, and then a big flurry of development, and then ending up with, with that sort of winner take all a little bit. And unfortunately, the visualizations get worse. Um, so then we have sort of a similar sort of parallel for, for kind of data science. And obviously, the, the timeline is, is much greater, right? I mean, people have sort of been talking about data science or machine learning for a really, really long time, right? Back to Hebb's rule, Perceptron, uh, backpropagation, SVM, et cetera, et cetera. And I think really one story that, that this definitely sort of tells, right, is that big data is a really challenging topic to sort of succeed in, but you know, sort of AI or, or data science is, is even more complex, right? And I think one thing that I noticed when I was sort of looking at all of these events preparing for this is that there was this really sort of big, big change, right? With, with Deep Blue happening right here, all the Deep Blue was just modeling a game, right? It's really, really just at the end of the day, it's just chess. It's looking at all the different combinations, right? There happen to be a lot of them, but you can sort of scope it from there. If you look at sort of when GFS was introduced, it'd probably be about there on the timeline. And I think that this really brings about the, the first lesson where we've seen that big data 
and artificial intelligence are, are really totally coexisting, right? All of the algorithms that are, are, are you're going to come across these days, right, are, are ones that have existed for a really, really long time for the most part. And a lot of the big change in, in sort of innovation is just simply being able to handle all of that information and really try and, and learn from it. And so that's really the first pattern that I see a lot from, from successful customer projects is lots of, of high quality data, right? In, in a way that's sort of, uh, yeah, well collected, easy to use. And so from this perspective, we've really seen that big data is a really missing link for successful machine learning projects, right? And really, I think the big changes today are the ability to both collect and analyze it and then apply these sort of classical machine learning algorithms on top of it, right? You can go back and read all of the papers for those particular algorithms. And you know, a lot of that core innovation is, is before my lifetime. And so really the combination of these two is, is where we see a lot of a lot of challenges in organizations. And so that sort of segues into pattern two, which is reducing complexity. I think in particular coming from like a history background in undergrad, really just trying to make things as simple as possible is, is super advantageous. Simply because when it actually comes time, as Krish was saying, to go get funding, if you can't explain it, you're not gonna get funding. And your data science project is just gonna be a science project. It's not actually gonna go anywhere. And so I think that there are really three kinds of classes of complexity. There's gonna be the, the data problem, which I just sort of talked about. How do we wrangle all of this information and then apply it given whatever algorithm we may want to. There's the people problem, which is how do you get these different teams and skill sets to really work cohesively? And then there's the systems problem, right? Managing infrastructure, security, reliability, et cetera. And so I'll echo some more Google research here, here and just point out that you know this fraction, I, I don't know, has anybody heard of this paper by show of hands? Okay, do your research. Um, <laughs> This is a good one. Um, it talks about hidden technical debt in machine learning systems. It came out in 2015. And really, it just talks about how this is you know, Google's sort of observation. This is a, a visualization, if you will, of how much basically machine learning code is involved inside of a data science project. Right? It's like very, very little. And being able to understand it is obviously a really important part of it. But having everything around it, that's where the true pain is, right? And we're even lacking kind of a, you know, this is the technical applications. We're even lacking kind of the people or organizational dimension, which is absolutely real, especially in this new sort of field. And so really, from our perspective, the hardest part of, of AI, sort of getting away from the organizational challenges, which are absolutely there, is kind of big data, really being able to, to manage all of this complexity around there and that's why I think Spark has been so successful is because it really helps unify this into a cohesive toolkit that allows users to focus on their business problems a little bit more than the rest right and it's seen really huge adoption from uh, you know meetups um, Spark Summit that that sort of conference that I just referenced etc and one of the big reasons for its popularity is, is you know, the, the Spark APIs are, are really easy to use, right? They're, they're really quite simple. And it's really become the platform of choice for enterprises, including these, you know, mega scale companies, right? It was really uh, wild for me last year when Facebook was like, hey, we want to do a blog post with Databricks on how we're using Spark because, you know, the whole Hive thing that we we're using is like way too complex and this just makes it way easier. Right? Or Spark presentations by Facebook engineers at, uh, at Spark Summit. Right? And I think that is why it's becoming sort of a, a standard and how it's helping some of uh, just reduce some of the complexity to allow people to focus on business problems. And so, what Databricks' sort of focus is, is we want to try and solve each of these problems with this sort of unified platform um, to, to sort of allow you to not have to uh, you know, skip across tools 
or try and reduce, rather our goal is to try and reduce the cognitive load in order to deliver these projects. I think that's what's so powerful, as a side note, about some of Fernando's work is the visualization just ends up being a tool to reduce the cognitive load on really trying to be able to understand a large collection of information. And so, you know, there ends up being this, this kind of data problem, which is really getting the workflow up and running from end to end. Naturally, um, that's where we sort of propose Spark as a, a really unified analytics engine to really try and cover as many use cases as it possibly can, right? Um, sort of now I'll jump to, you know, sort of setting the context with data. Now let's jump to the people aspect of it, right? And this is a really important part. I think Chris did an awesome job talking about the organizational context and, and really data science as much as, uh, you know, we all, MIMS and MIDS together, have really learned, uh, you know, taking some time and, and going back to school, you know, you can't be a unicorn and just solve all potential problems about everything, right? It's something you really have to work together as a team. And I think that was one of, that was another great thing that I saw in Fernando's presentation where she points to the entire team of, of people that she works with, right? It's not just her in a dark room just sort of coding away for, uh, you know, however long it takes to sort of succeed with a project, it's, it's collaboration. And so while I think that there's this whole sort of data science, unicorn narrative, et cetera, I think it's like really not that true. And if you take that sort of ego-laden um, uh, perspective, you're gonna get yourself in a lot of problems because you aren't gonna be able to communicate effectively and you aren't gonna be able to work together. And so, well, Databricks isn't gonna help you check your ego, um, we do really wanna help facilitate getting people to sort of work together, right? And really that means working in a cohesive environment that allows you to go from end to end, right? Bringing everybody together. And so we have this sort of data science workspace, uh, support for multiple programming languages for, for practitioners, et cetera. And then I think lastly, to sort of talk some more about that, that kind of data science individual perspective, um, focus on your strengths and, and mitigate your weaknesses. I think this one can absolutely, unfortunately I did four patterns. It was, you know, Chris should have told me before that I was supposed to do three. Um, but really, I think the key point here, right, is that as data science practitioners, et cetera, you know, you, uh, at least I've seen uh, in uh, some customers, um, is that they end up trying to do everything all the time, right? Where it's like, hey, I need to manage this particular cluster from the low level infrastructure to all the way to the top to like building the web app that ends up serving it. And I think that when you start taking on that, that kind of amount of work, you're really gonna bog down your project and, and make it harder to deliver. And I think that's one thing that is a consistent thing that people really love about the Databricks platform is that we're gonna manage a lot of the system's complexity on your behalf. And you know, as I said, having even just written the book, I like wouldn't wanna manage those systems uh, because I'd rather focus on actually solving business problems or getting a project out the door or, or really helping other people sort of succeed. And so really just trying to automate a lot of that, that sort of DevOps, um, security constraints, et cetera, just hitting the check boxes so that you can really focus on your work. And so just to sort of summarize sort of Databricks' focus, right? Really trying to uh, accelerate capabilities of, of given individuals, and then I'll finish it off with, um, with that other smart quote by, by somebody just nearby. So really we're trying to provide this unified analytics platform to reduce complexity on behalf of uh, individual data teams. And Spark sits at the core, right? I just sort of made my pitch, naturally I have my biases, but I've made my pitch for, for why Spark is such a successful tool in, in this area, right? And you're gonna have all your given data sources anyways, right? Those aren't necessarily gonna change, but really, I guess one thing I haven't touched on too much, but we really see the cloud as the, the strong capability for given organizations to move with agility. And so, you know, we're a, a cloud managed service. 
Then we have uh, you know, this Databricks runtime, which is really just an optimized version of Apache Spark that provides a lot of, of sort of the nicer tooling around it. So again, you can focus on your work. And then you know, this collaborative workspace to really be able to go end to end with your given projects. And while this is you know, naturally a, a Databricks pitch a little bit, this slide in particular, I think really this like applies whether you end up using Databricks or not, right? Each of those patterns aren't just like Databricks patterns. It's you know, reducing complexity, allowing people to work together, um, et cetera, et cetera, that, that really brings about success, right? And um, naturally, I think one thing we see more and more these days is cybersecurity incidents. Um, you know, the iSchool has prioritized having you know, a cybersecurity program because it comes up all the time. And so with that, I think really being able to do that in a secure manner is, is also really important. So that's sort of the Databricks pitch. I think I'll pivot back to sort of iSchool land now. And um, I don't know if anybody saw a Medium post, but did anybody see this article by Michael Jordan a couple weeks ago? Show of hands. OK. Nice. Um, so he wrote this article that you all should definitely read. It says, artificial intelligence, the revolution hasn't happened yet. And I'll just sort of read a, a particular portion that I really liked, and I'm going to read off the screen so I don't mess it up. Um, but in short, he found that computers will not be able to match humans and their ability to reason abstractly about real world situations. We will need well thought out interactions of humans and computers to solve our most pressing problems. And we want computers to trigger new levels of human creativity, not replace human creativity, whatever that it might actually mean. And I think that this is just a perfect link to what Fernanda had said and what Krish had said, where you know, when you come at sort of data science, it's like, hey, I'm going to automate everything. We're just going to be able to predict everything. It's really easy to just sort of imagine this like mythical hammer that will smash any problem you may have. But really, you know, this isn't even coming from me, right? This is coming from you know one of the foremost experts in the field. And you know, this revolution hasn't really happened yet. And really, people aren't going anywhere. And finding a good, cohesive way for machines to work together with people and really leverage both of their skill sets is going to be a really, really important part of, of our coming future. And I think that's kind of one of the, just to sort of jump back to the particular timelines here, that was one thing I really wanted to drill home with these particular timelines, because if we look at hey, sort of big data, I think big data is kind of like a solved problem, right? It's, there's always going to be challenges. You can always make it sort of a little bit more abstract. But it's sort of a closed source system, right? It's kind of the deep blue-esque, hey, there's like a limited set of interactions. But if you sort of squish down this timeline and put them on the same scales, you're going to see that we've got a big runway for artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're really, really just getting started. And so with that, be sure to keep humans as a part of how you're actually going to go about solving problems. And so with that, that's my presentation. We've got a couple of minutes before a break. Any uh, questions for Phil? It's break time. People feeling it's break time. <laughs> Anyone? I'm going to ask you one. Okay. Um, so you you explain a little bit about your kind of your background in history mm -hmm. um, and how this how it informs it. Tell tell us a little more about what you what you've got out of kind of being a being a kind of history grad and how this this kind of plays with the work that you do now. Yeah, I think. Uh, a big, really big lesson that uh, I've sort of taken away is, is really just doing your homework and trying to make things simple, right? I think when you look at how things evolve over time, right, we end up seeing these sort of cycles. And there's been a lot of uh, talk recently, some books published, and we'll dive into them at this point. but really we end up sort of repeating lots of things. And uh, one author puts it that oftentimes what happens is that people forget 
the events that happen outside of their current lifetimes, right? And so they don't really identify of like, hey, that sort of thing can actually happen or that event has actually really happened before because it was outside of their lifetimes, right? That's why I think I tried to take that big timeline for AI, if you will, and maybe that's why I have such a familiarity for big data because it's really happened inside of my lifetime and I've been at least a very, very minuscule part of the conversation and I think really trying to understand those cycles as opposed to just diving really deeply into some uh, arcane tool set ends up being a, a really, really big advantage. So that would be, be something I've really consistently okay. taken away. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Philip, thanks again. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.